Hello out there. You are very much welcome to the program Exclusive Personality on Anglican Cable Network Nigeria Television, reaching you from the nation's capital, Abuja. Exclusive Personality is a program designed to educate, inform, and transform members of the public through experiences of notable personalities who have distinguished themselves in this life through hard work, diligence, and the grace of God. It is also a program designed to treat some topical issue concerning faith, ideologies, and the state of affairs in the polity. Our guest for today is not just a church father, he's an author, he's a writer, a preacher. He was once former Deputy Vice Chancellor of Lagos State University, former Vice Chancellor of Ajay Crowder University, or your, and the currently the Anglican Bishop of Elisha Diocese and Bishop Theologian, the Right Reverend Dabo Asaju. Professor, you're welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much for bringing me here. Thank you, my Lord and Bishop Theologian. My Lord, oftentimes we hear, we read about you, but you agree with me, there are some people who would like to know who is this Bishop Theologian? Who is this Bishop uh, Professor? Can you tell us, tell the world, who is Right Reverend Professor Dabo Asaju? Well, I... I was born at uh, Iyara, Ijomo, in Kogi State, and uh, in the year 1961, November 16th, I share birthday with uh, Namde Azikwe and uh, Chino Achebe. These are my heroes. <laughs> and uh, I had my primary education at St. Andrew's College, Kaba, then Holy Trinity Primary School, Lokoja, then during the war, we moved to Eloni, and my father sent me to a Muslim school, which was nearest to us. So I had exposure to Islam. And then after that, I went to Abdulaziz Atai Memorial College of Kene, one of the, it's called the Lion of the Northern Nigeria in those days. And after that, I had my HSC in 1977 at Federal Government College Eloni. Then I went to University of Eloni for my first degree, second degree, and the PhD. Then after that, I I had a specialized missions master's at a Birmingham Christian College, Birmingham, UK. Eventually, I became a lecturer at University of Illinois in 1983. And uh, in 1984, I crossed over to Lagos State University. That's almost 39 years ago as a foundation staff and, and uh, staff lecturer in Christian studies. I have worked in, I worked in Lagos State University for about 39 years, thereabout. I rose to become a professor in the year 2004. And then um, I became dean, uh, dean of the Faculty of Art, Director of Center for General Studies. I was chairman of Academy Staff Union of Universities, ASU, under Tahiru Jega in 1988. That is about 34 years ago. That's right. That's when I became ASU chairman. And I led most of the struggles for ASU at that time. I could remember as a young man, as a chairman of ASU, I drove my Volkswagen Beatles into Dodan Barak to challenge Babangida. And so, and after that, we, we were the ones that were instrumental to bringing universities together and bringing to be the condition of service that they still operates today. So, I had, I had labored in Lagos State University. And then uh, I was a visiting professor to Birmingham University, United Kingdom. And in that capacity, I had examined three PhDs there now, visiting professor to Bayreuth University in Germany. And um, during the period of my sabbatical and my fellowship there at, uh, at uh, England, I had a license of the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury. So I was a priest of the Church of England at the St. Philip's Cathedral under the Bishop uh, John St. Tamu who later became the Archbishop of uh, York. And I am privileged to be a member of one of the highest Anglican bodies worldwide, Inter-Anglican Standing Committee on Unity, Faith and Order. I'm the one representing the country. In that capacity, I had direct contact with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it was during one of the experiences at Canterbury Cathedral, he gave me the pectoral cross of George Carey and Ron Williams. So I, in the Anglicanism, I had been in the Church of England, then Church of Nigeria. I was ordained under the hands of uh, uh, Primate uh, Abiodun Adetiloye in the Diocese of Lagos. And when the Diocese of Lagos split into two, I fell into the Diocese of Lagos West. So I was a pioneer of, of a clergy of Lagos West. We, 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 Lord, before we come to that, because we are going to be discussing about your um, uh, journey in ministry. So your educational background, you are telling us about you read both here 
and outside the country. That's yeah. what it means. Oh, yes. So in all those, you also made mention of uh, leading the struggle so that to unify university. What made you to do that? What prompted that action? There must be something why you led the struggle. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Governance is the act of God. Even the system of government we have now is taken from the Bible. The Lord your God is your king. That's executive government. He is your lawmaker. That's legislature. He is your righteous judge. is judiciary. So he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. Nebuchadnezzar said he reigns in the affairs of men. He enthrones and he dethrones. Therefore, Christians must be involved in every aspect of governance at every level. Martin Luther King Jr. was the one who spearheaded the revolution of the black civil rights movement in America That's that right. gave recognition to the blacks in America to today. He was the one who had a dream that put them to where they are now. And so he was a full-time Baptist gentleman. Martin Luther was the one that led the revolution against Roman Catholicism and opened up Protestantism that brought up the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the development in the arts and the sciences today. So we as Christians, we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We must directly take charge of governance. Politics or governance is running the affairs of a world created by our God. Mm. And so it has always been my motivation and that is why in recent times I have been a watchman speaking for the body of Christ. You type YouTube and you type my name, you see my speeches. Deeper Life, uh, Komoye was 80 years old. I was the one he called to preach. When Khan was 45 years, I was the one that flew to Abuja to speak. Kerubi and Seraphim Church, Aladura called all of them together, brought me to Wuse. I was the one that speak. Baptists also called a general meeting of their leaders. I spoke at Bowen. And so I have a ministry that is beyond the Anglican Church. So that is the role. You should speak, you should intervene in state matters, and you should, if possible, be practically involved in leading change in society. It's not enough to do advocacy. You must be there. You must be there. Not enough to do advocacy coming from Bishop uh, Asaju. My Lord, we have talked about whom you are. You've talked about your educational background, and of course, what you must have done and what you must have achieved. But now, we are looking at uh, many personalities. We are looking at uh, uh, a professor, an academic, which you've explained. Can you tell us your journey so far in ministry? Well, my journey in ministry is intertwined with my academic journey because, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, I was ordained by Archbishop Ade Tiloye. Then, as at that time, I, before I was ordained, I had gone through a lot of journeys. I had had a encounter with E.A. Adeboye even before he became the General Vassar of Redeem. He was a pastor who mentored me at the University of Illinois in the 1980s. I had been with Deeper Life when they started Deeper Life in the 1970s. And I was there when Winners Chapel started as a student leader. When he started at Illinois, I was there. When he came to Lagos, I was part of the first 40 people. I was there at Four Square Gospel Church in Badagri when I started job in Lasso. I had gone around. And eventually, of course, many people know this. I rose to become a general overseer of a Pentecostal church. I was an archbishop with four bishops under me. I had ordained over 38 ministers. I had my radio program, my television program on Lagos Television 1996. I had ministers in London, in Germany, many branches all over the country. And the Lord said, leave all this. I took you around so you could gain experience about yes. what other churches are doing. Your work is in your church back in the Anglican church. So after becoming an archbishop wearing purple mitre, I dropped all of them. I came back to the Anglican church. I became an ordinant. And I, later I was made a deacon. And when I was made a deacon, I was posted to head the Church of Epiphany. After Epiphany as vicar, that was in 1998. Then I also was posted to the Church of Transfiguration, K2 Lagos. After that, I was posted to Bishop James Johnson Church as vicar. After that, I became the chaplain of the Chapel of Light, Lagos State University, University Chapel. Then after that, I was made a canon. I was made an archdeacon of the Diocese of Lagos West. We wrote the constitution together. And it was during my time at Lagos West that I introduced what they call the Covenant Seed Form. All countries, all churches in Nigeria, diocese are using it now. From my experiences from my former church, I introduced it to them. The very first Bible study when Lagos West was established 21 or so years ago. So we thank God that these ideas are bringing money to people today. So after that, I was asked to uh, become the Bishop Theologian. I was elected in the year 2009 as Bishop Theologian, consecrated on the 10th of January 2010 at St. Andrew's Cathedral, Wari. And then after that, I was appointed 
Obi, the rector of Krada Graduate Theological Seminary, Abe Okota, Nigeria's leading theological seminary at that time, because we had 23 professors who were teaching there from Cambridge University, Oxford University, Virginia University, Moore College, Australia. I sent in two of my lecturers to train at Cambridge. They were bringing them from Cambridge, Portacourt, Calabar. Once you have a professor of Anglican extraction anywhere in this country, they were teaching. So we had the best as at that time. And all language school students from all the seven theological colleges were coming to study under me for one year, then postgraduate study. So we were producing at least 500 people which is the which market. I'm a beneficiary well, of I'm very proud you are an outstanding <laughs> person when you were there and so it is a ministry that has touched lives everywhere after that I was asked to become the vice chancellor of Ajayakrada University reluctantly I accepted it and uh, I served at Ajayakrada University for five years 2015 to 2020 uh, when they appealed to me to take a second time I said no the day I left Ajayakrada University the next day I was in class at Lagos State University back to base and started teaching until I was elected the Bishop of uh, Elisha. So this is my journey so far. Thank I, you. I have had my exposures locally and uh, also outside this country. Thank of you. Of course, I have also been very active in GAFCON. I was a speaker at GAFCON 2008 and a member of the Theological Resource Group. There are so many things, to the glory of God. To the glory of God. Thank you so much. But my Lord, uh, uh, there must be somebody who so is your mentor in ministry. Maybe someone who motivated you. Can you just tell us who is your mentor in ministry? Uh, two of them, uh, Most Reverend Abiodun Adetiloye, who ordained me and gave me some of his ornaments and uh, gave me opportunity. I was actually his biographer, I wrote the story of his life, but it didn't get published because as I was about to hit the press, others went and wrote something and launched it, and so I, I stepped that mind. Then uh, Archbishop Peter Jasper Akiola, he is my role model, he is my father, he is the one who consecrated me. We never had a bishop theologian in the whole of the Anglican Communion all over the world. He was the one that created that office and asked me to come and function there. And since then, he's been mentoring me. When I was enthroned, it was the robe of uh, Primate Peter Akiola that I wore on that day. And I wore also the pectoral cross of the Archbishop of Canterbury, two Archbishops of Canterbury. And uh, I've had fathers who have also supported me. Uh, but those, there are many of them whom have lived in the Archbishop Adebayo uh, Akinde, Archbishop Ronti uh, Otobogun, a number of other fathers. I've learned Archbishop Nicholas Oko. I worked with him and he mentored me. Archbishop Oko was the chairman of the Theological Resource Group of GAFCON, and so I worked under him. So I've been fortunate to have served under Adeti Loye, under Peter Akinola, under Nicholas Oko, all of them fantastic primates. I've taken one thing or the other from them. But Baba Akinola is my direct father and my mentor. I will not take a step without going to see him. Whenever I was confused, I went to him. What do I do? He will give me the way out. When I was elected Bishop of Elisha, I ran to him and I took my note and my pen. I am going on another assignment. How do I do it? Where do I go? And he gave me a roadmap. He is my father. Thank you very much, my lord. That's wonderful. And you'll be proud of you as a son. Yes, and my lord, now we have to go a little because the existing personality is just dealing, uh, one of the things he deals with is all about faith, uh, beside every other thing. Now, my lord, we, we look at the concept of Holy Communion, which is also biblical, established by Jesus himself. But now, a lot of dogmatic theologies and the concepts people are trying to interpret. We have people that believe that is consubstantiation. You have people talking about transubstantiation. You have receptionism. Please, my Lord, can you just explain this term in line with Holy Communion and where does Anglican Communion believe in what all these things are talking about? Basically, what is consubstantiation? What is transubstantiation and receptionism as regards to um, Holy Communion and where does Anglican believe? Well, I will want to start on the note of advising people to be simple Christians. Take your Bible, read your Bible, obey your Bible, don't allow your philosophy to get into your heads. There will always be divergences of opinions on any theological matter. Whatever position people take in theological issues, they will always have Bible to support them because the Bible is very ambivalent in certain respects. People can interpret it in one way or the other. I give you an example. We want to worship quietly. We go to the Bible. The Lord is in the holy temple. Let all people be silent before Him. Good. Pentecostals want to make noise. They will go to the Bible and say, Make a joyful noise to the Lord. So people want to interpret it in one way or the other. 
don't let us allow denominationalism to be in the way of our faith. Leave that to the eggheads who think they want to argue. When it comes to matters of religion, we walk by faith and not by sight. That was what Tertullian was saying, that philosophy can be the mother of heresy. Therefore, you should allow your instruction to come from the Bible, from the Holy Spirit, and not on the divergences of theological idea. We will never agree. So, denominationalism is in the way. So are theological concepts. Now we have come as Anglican Church from the Roman Catholic Church. We still have a heavy baggage of Roman Catholicism. And so, even in the Anglican Church, there are three different types of Anglicanism. There is Anglo-Catholic, which is high church. There is the Evangelical, which is low church. And there is also the Anglican Charismatic. These are all shades of Anglicanism. When you want to come from the Roman Catholic Church, they believe in transubstantiation. Transubstantiation, broken down simply means, is a transmission of the substance. What it means is that God Almighty, through the Lord Jesus, has instituted the Holy Spirit and the communion to be used as a way of remembrance of his death and burial and his resurrection. This is, on Monday, Thursday, we celebrate the institution of the Holy Communion. He said, as often as you gather, do this in remembrance of me. In the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he blessed it. He broke it. He said, this is my body, given for you. Do this as often as you meet in remembrance of me. He shared to the twelve. He said, this is my blood of the covenant which is shed for you for the remission of sins. He took the wine, he blessed it, and he said, take it, drink it in remembrance of me. This is a simple practice, a simple command. Get your bread, get your wine in a holy environment, and bless the bread, bless the wine, present it. as It is representative of the body and the blood of Christ, and eat it, and that should suffice. But people want to go further, to read deep meanings that were not read into it directly when God gave the commandment. Transubstantiation says, by the Roman Catholic belief, that they call it mass, they call it sacrifice. You see, the altar table where we do that Holy Communion is representative of the Ark of the Covenant. The church is representative of the pattern of the tabernacle and the, and the temple. Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the altar court. So in the Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant. The important thing of the Ark of Covenant, apart from the cherubims that are overshadowing it, is the mercy seat. There is a mercy seat there that the high priest must come to bring the blood of an unblemished animal and sacrifice once in a year on behalf of the people of Israel. And so we now come, the table we have in the altar is representing the Ark of Covenant. The mercy seat now is what we are representing by the sacrifice of the mass. It is a mass. It is a sacrifice in Roman Catholic Church. So they believe that you bring in the bread, you bring in the wine. As soon as you consecrate the wine, the, body, the bread and wine change to become the real body and the real blood of Jesus. That means there's a transmission of the substance. The bread is set aside. Wine is set aside. It now becomes the real body and the real blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't teach us that. That is transubstantiation. That is transubstantiation. The substance has been transmitted. So. Consubstantiation is a departure from that. Consubstantiation was brought by Martin Luther as part of his 95 Thesis. You see, when the Anglican Church started, we broke off from the, we are part of the reformation of the Protestant churches because Martin Luther of Germany, he, he, he disagreed with many doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, disagreed with Mariology as the intermediary between God and man, disagreed with the existence of poetry as another abode for, of the dead before their sentence, uh, which is what the Muslims do. They do after burial, they do, they do fidaw after this. Catholics believe you, you, you go to a place called poetry, you can still pray for the dead, their destination can still change. No, the Bible says it is appointed unto man wants to die after that, the judgment. the judgment. We disagree with that. We disagree with the concept of papal infallibility. We disagree with the equating Vatican resolution of papal bull. With the Bible Bible. We disagree with their canon on the Bible. Their canon is bigger than the lot of things. But one of the things he disagreed with was substance, transubstantiation. So Matthew Luther said there should be consubstantiation. In other words, you are representing the Holy Communion by the bread and the wine. Let me digress a little bit. If I come in here and you bring in the flag of Nigeria here, you sing the national anthem here, I must be upstanding. Nigeria is not here. 
but Nigeria is being represented, you must give the respect. You want to swell in somebody into office, wants to bring the flag of Nigeria, you can do it even here, not in Asoro. It represents it. So you will not say that Nigeria is here. It is the representation of Nigeria that is here. So consubstantiation says you have the bread, you have the wine, but when you place them and you consecrate them, they are not changing to real body or real blood, but the presence of the body and the blood, they are here with you. That is co substantiation the two substances are together standing so when you take it you are taking the body of christ and the blood of christ not the real one but the representation that is consubstantiation but anglican theology goes further than that it developed further and it goes into receptionism receptionism simply means there is no transubstantiation when you are doing the Holy Communion. Nothing is changing in the substance. It's still your bread. It's still your wine. There is no consubstantiation to say, yes, when I'm consecrating it, the body is standing beside it, the blood is the blood standing beside it. No. We are saying it remains what it is. It is a, it's a bread. It is a wine. But by the time you consecrate it and you give it to the receiver, mm. by faith, it becomes in you the body and the blood. So that Holy Communion is a symbol of the real body and blood. That reception is, that's where we stand in Anglican theology. But there is no end to all this. You will be even be surprised that uh, there are a lot of other things that happen. I remember during the time of COVID-19, many Pentecostal churches were doing Holy Communion by, by Zoom and by television. And so uh, the primate called me as Bishop Theologian. He said, can you give me a comment on what these people are doing? What, 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 what? And, and I said, it's wrong. Because there is a point where you need to hold the bread and there's a contagion effect. You must consecrate it. You can't do that by Zoom. You can't do that as everybody holds your own. If everybody holds their bread and their wine, then they are now celebrants. They're not celebrants. There's one celebrant in the in Holy of Holies, communion. others are receivers. Yes, and so they're, but they, are, they have copied everything in Anglican and they are doing Holy Communion anyhow and they are messing it up. We as Anglicans is a symbol of the thanksgiving of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for us. We do it often. When we take it into our body, it becomes in us, the body and the brother of Christ. That is reception, is it? We are not transubstantiates. We are not co-substantiates. But we are now receptionists. We are. Thank you very much, my Lord. Uh, because of our time, I think we take one more question. Maybe in subsequent time, we can now take other ones. Um, uh, we, 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 hear, we see veil in the art, especially in Anglican churches. In fact, uh, people may not understand what that means, but I know it has a, a biblical and theological interpretation. Please, can you tell us uh, the concept of veil being the altar of every Anglican church? The you mean veil. the veil we the, put on the table? No, on, on the altar. That's on the altar, the veil. As soon as you come, you see the altar, you see the veil, and the ones on the table as well. These are just ornaments for the altar of God. You remember on Monday, Thursday, when you're closing the service, as you're approaching Good Friday, you have to remove and strip the altar, altar. of all this to symbolically mean that we are removing all decorations and we are in a sober mood, a sorrowful mood. These are just derivatives from the Old Testament concept of vestments. The Lord Almighty gave prescriptions on investments to be worn by the high priest, to be worn by people, and what is to be put on the altar. The vase have no deep spiritual meaning. It is simply representative of our belief on what is at the altar and the type of services we are doing. You have to cover it with a light linen, and then you now have to put a liturgical color. Liturgical colors are the creations of church. They are not the creations of God. They are not biblical mandate. They are just the church that says you have green to represent a period. You have white. During Easter, it's white. It is to give you a theological presentation of the season we are in and the type of service we are doing. If you are going for a marriage, it's going to be white. But whiteness is a symbol of the purity of the Holy Spirit. The purity, the cleanness of the Holy Spirit. Even in the book of Revelation, God said, if you overcome, I will give you white robes to wear. So these are just symbols that the church designed for us to be able to beautify the altar and to be able to pass across the message. Thank you very much, my Lord. Then, my Lord, uh, we hear like investment of uh, bishops. Most of us don't, don't know the meaning of what it is. We hear, we see the crucia, we see the mitre, the pictoria cross, wretched signet, episcopal ring. Uh, in just a few minutes, can you just explain to us what that means? Because it's not just for decoration. They oh, have significance. All right. the, the Anglican Church, derived from the Roman Catholic Church, we know, 
The bishopric is episcopal. We are episcopally governed. We are synodically led. And so the three forms of government are built in the bishops. He is the bishop, the one who is the diocesan. He is also the president of the synod. He also has a bishop's court. Bishop's court is not just a residence. It's a place where adjudication is done in the church of God. And so a bishop in the Anglican church, like the Roman Catholic church, is a monarch. A monarch must have a throne and he has to be enthroned. That's the reason why there's enthronement service and the bishop's throne is there in the church. The bishop is a king. That's why you address him like Eze or Kabese. And in that capacity, he must have a crown. The crown of the bishop is the mitre. That mitre is a sign or it is a derivation from the old Roman practice. It may have its own pagan origin in the past, but they have been Christianized and reinterpreted in the Christian town. So the mitre is the crown that a king must have a crown. Queen Elizabeth has a crown. That is the crown. It's a holy crown and it has its meaning. So that crown is there to show you that you are a monarch on a throne. This pectoral cross is a sign that you are carrying the cross of Jesus. It's a sign that you are ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. When you join the military, you sign off your life to the yes, government. You can be sent to war to go and die. This is not supposed to be an ornament that is a decorative or flashing thing. In fact, Baba Kela was saying that we should actually be using wood as a pectoral cross. It's not a decoration. It's not an ornament for beauty. It is a sign that I've accepted this responsibility. I've put upon myself the cross of Christ. I am ready to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. This ring is the uh, Episcopal ring, signet ring. It used to be a ring that had a seal so that when the bishop made a decree or signed a letter, he would stamp it like a seal. That was the original one. But what it means really is that I am married to the church of God and I'm married to my diocese. This marriage ring here, with you and your wife, you are saying for better, for worse. In every situation, we are together, no divorce, and we stay with you for the rest of my life. So when a bishop is made to be in charge of a see, his jurisdiction, his territory, he wears a ring, and that ring is a marriage, that you are married to the church, you can't divorce the church. And nothing else matters but to serve the church. You, do, you are not too longer in, in control of your life, you now can be sent wherever the church sent you to, 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 you go and serve there. That is the meaning of this singlet ring. That's the meaning of this pectoral cross. The crozier, if you see the crozier, the way it is designed, is like the shepherd's rod. We are shepherds of the people, therefore, you hold the shepherd's rod, and when you are being enthroned or you are being consecrated, you say, take this staff. It's a symbol of your authority. Take care of the sheep. Don't devour them. Don't oppress them. You should maintain discipline. A rod is used to guide the sheep in the direction. A rod is used to pull them back when they are going astray. That's why the mouth is crooked. Okay. And that's the that's the that you to, to pull them back when they are there. And a rod is also used to beat the sheep when they are going out of line. And so it's a rod of discipline, a rod of authority. It's not a fanciful thing. It's not a, 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 an instrument of arrogance. It's an instrument of the servant leader. You are there to serve the people, to go look for the lost sheep. Jesus said, you have a hundred sheep, one has gone astray, go bring the other one back. And that is our duty. We are servants of the people. We are to take care of them. All these things have their, all have their, have their significance. The cope is, is derived from the Roman Catholic cope that the Romans were wearing. It has its own significance too. The rochet there is the white one with the band there. Their bandness, that redness that you have, the, the scarlet, is a symbol of royalty. It's a symbol of royalty. It's a symbol of a, of a, of, 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 it, it simply means royalty. Yeah, and, and that, so when you have the scarlet there, it's royal royalty. And then the uh, purple is used also for royalty. But that is it. But the white one is a white robe, just like the, the white uh, uh, surplice of, uh, of, the, of the minister of God. You wear your cassock after your, after your, your, your shirt. This one we wear, this is whiteness. For the clergy, you wear a black shirt, for example, or a black cassock, for example. What does it mean? I am putting on the darkness of the world as an agent of light onto the world. The world is dark. I'm mean, going to minister to the dark. And in the midst of the darkness of the world, I am a bearer of the light of God. White contrasts against black. So when they see it on your neck, they identify you. This is a servant of God. The yoke of Christ is on you. The light of God is on you in a dark world. And so these are symbolisms. And the other things we do, I, I was explaining to them in my diocese a few days ago, even the procession. This procession, you must start with a... Process with the, with the cross bearer yeah. because Constantine 
was told to put the cross on the sign of his uh, banner when he was fighting against Mazentius when the Roman Empire was at war and he converted Christianity, uh, Roman Empire to Christianity. Uh, uh, no. So he was the one that said, by this cross you are going to conquer. God showed him that cross. And so onward Christian soldier marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. So every time we have a service, we are going to spiritual warfare. On behalf of the congregation, we have many problems. And so the cross bearer must go before us. When the cross bearer goes, who follows them? Is the choir, Jehoshaphat. Put the choir in front before the soldiers follow. So when they go, then the ministers of God, Ukochuku, can now do prayer and the ministry of the world. We are all ministers of God. All we do in the Anglican Church have symbolism. So our dress, we inherited part of them from the description in Leviticus of the vestment of the high priest. He also has vestment of what he wears and even the stole and the gadu. All the, some from Judaism, so from Roman Catholic Church. Thank you very much. Uh, church leaders capable of providing solutions uh, of what the Nigeria will be a better place? Are there some experiences and testimonies that the bishop would like to share? These and many more you will get when we come back for break. Please do join us again. You can't deceive God. Hmm. None of us can deceive God. Nobody can actually become a leader if God has not ordained it. Mm. What is the right knowledge? The right knowledge is scripture. Yes, sir. Because the Bible is light years ahead of science. But I usually will ask God, how do I explain this the thing spirit. in a way that people will understand? Hmm. The Spirit of God can anoint you to teach, can anoint you to preach, can anoint you for business, speak, can anoint you in politics. The scripture speaking, Psalm chapter 107 verse 20. He sent forth his word and healed them and delivered them from every of their destruction. We are trusting the Lord that as we discuss his word this day, God will deliver us from every form of ignorance, every form of destruction, and grant us grace to walk even in the path of wisdom. In the name of Jesus. Amen. No matter how many bishops come to attend the, the synod, synod or any service in the diocese, yes, only the bishop can carry his pastoral staff, his cousia. All other bishops cannot come with their cousia or their pastoral staff. Monday, Thursday, Jesus Christ instituted the Holy Communion, the Last Supper with the disciples and said we should do it in remembrance of, of him. The church has come to bring it to your notice that this man that you see putting on a mitre into the service is coming in as an holy, dignified, and the authority of the church. A bishop in the Anglican church, like the Roman Catholic church, is a monarch. A monarch must have a throne, and he has to be enthroned. That's the reason why they are saying throne service, and the bishop's throne is there in the church. It comes the Holy Eucharist, he said, we should do this continually mm. in remembrance of him. I can't fight for God. It's one of the uniqueness of Christianity. We don't fight for our God. Exclusive Personality is a program designed to educate, inform and transform members of the public through the experiences of notable personalities who have distinguished themselves in this life through hard work, diligence and the grace of God. It is also a program designed to treat some topical issues concerning faith ideologies, and the state of affairs in the polity. Glad to know that you are still there. If you're just joining us, this is Exclusive Personality on Anglican Cable Network Nigeria. And our guest has been the Bishop Theologian and also the Anglican Bishop of Dice of Elysia, the Right Reverend Professor that was Saju. My Lord, thank you once thank again. You. Thank you. Uh, before we went on break, my Lord, uh, we have discussed and told us what all these things means, the cruiser, the mitre, and what have you. We're going to shift a little bit and also go properly into um, the things of the polity of the nation. Um, looking at uh, how Nigeria is now, 
a majority of people, if not all the whole citizens, they are not happy with what is happening. Now, my Lord, do you think that both church leaders and political leaders have a role to play in fixing this country? Oh, yes. We have a role to play as, in fixing this country. Actually, we have better roles to play. Why do I say that? You mean the church leaders? The church leaders have better role to play. I am not very comfortable with a situation where we play church and we are not addressing the state of the nation. The lives of people are being wasted. Injustice is no longer available for the ordinary man. And people are being wasted and the, in the, many are in the, the uh, IDP camps. And the churches, all they can talk about is their own enlargement of buildings, new structures, uh, conventions and gathering, and talking about materialism. I think we are gravely mistaken. I challenged WF Kumuyi when I had the opportunity to deliver the lecture at a seated body. The Vice President of Jibaji was seated, Governor of Lagos was seated, I challenged them both. I told the Vice President, you are a pastor and you are number two in this government. Like Esther, you are in office for a time like this. This country is being messed up. What are you doing about that? You have to rise up. You are quiet. And I told Kumuyi, I said, go and tell Adeboye, you are too quiet. You are not saying anything. And you have the crowd. And all oh, church leaders, we are complicit. We are the ones that teach them in church. What did we teach them in church? The gospel we teach, does it transform lives in such a way that when they get to government, they fear God and they do right? Christians, Muslims, they are joining in looting this country, heavy debt body, insecurity, unemployment, inflation, poverty, everything. The church is as corrupt as the society. So what you cannot save among yourselves, you can't imply in the society. So we must cure ourselves and then we go out there. Christianity is simple. Christianity is humility. Christianity is contentment. All this arrogance and this aristocracy, they are strange to Christian culture. You can't be more Christian than Jesus Christ. We are called the watchmen. Ezekiel said, if you see danger, blow the alarm. If they don't repent, their blood will be on their head. But if you don't do so, I will require their blood from their hands. So God is going to require the blood of the, these Nigerians from the hand of the church. We are not preaching the real gospel that can save. Our evangelism is very low. We are planting churches, look right and center, and then look and corner. And we are not really evangelizing. It is just business for so many of the churches. It's sickening. So many churches everywhere, no impact upon society. Our gospel is being compromised. Our gospel is in trouble. So what I think we should do is to sit down and begin to call leaders to order, even though at the risk of our lives, confront them, expose them, pray for them, and guide them, and give them proper monitoring. But beyond that, we should do two important things. We should be able to collaborate in such a way that we can even bring out the best among our various segments and throw them up into the politics and back them with the figure. Anglican church members are millions. Roman Catholics are millions. Pentecostals are many millions. Aladura are millions. We have the population to do that. But because we are not united, let's respect our common organ can and let us begin to work with it, make sure they have credible leadership, work with them, encourage Christians to go into politics, bypass the two or two major political parties, go to somewhere neutral, and let us be able to mobilize the youth who are able to change the tide. All we need to do is to articulate a proper manifesto, write books, mobilize the people, educate them, don't tell them what you will do, tell them how you will do it and how workable it is, then you throw up real people, do everything possible to prevent rigging or minimize it, and we can get the right people in power. We can flush out all these people. That's what we should do. Second thing we need to do is we should be able to sit as a church to bring the best of the brains of the church in every profession and draw up a blueprint for the solving of the problem of Nigeria. Even if I'm not in office, I should be able to say, how do you face the problem in education? What do you do to face the health sector? You are training doctors, they go outside the country, nurses go outside the country, people are running away. How do we deal with security? How can we re-engineer the army? How can we re-engineer the police? police? How can we go back to federalism so that the regions can become autonomous, semi-autonomous as it used to be, and we have a weak center? How can we prevent the calamity we are in now? Because we are not doing that. All you call darkness is nothing but the absence of light. The church is the light of the world. God is not going to hold unbelievers responsible. They don't belong to the kingdom. This world was created by our father. Rulership is our responsibility. It's our birthright, not their birthright. So when you abscond, then they will be the one to dominate. So that is what we should do. If you do all these things, we endure the present situation and pray that God will just keep us afloat until this government clears itself out of the way. 
is a disaster. Everyone says it's a disaster. And Christians are in power. There are no stars in this, in, the, in, this, in this government. And my pain is that anyone who has anything to do with this government at all, in any capacity, should never be considered in year 2023. They should never. All those who are contesting the election, they are betrayal of the common cause of this country. They should not, the, the, the people who sponsor this government should never be there. The people who served in this government should never be there. They killed this country. It's resurrection we are praying for. And we should be able to be sensitive. I've said it everywhere. We have different tribes in this country. We have to stabilize this country at this time. Everyone should step down and let the Southeast produce the best they can give us and let us have a new dispensation. After that, it goes around like that. We should have a rotation system. We should stop this practice of having two terms. It's a calamity to have a bad government for two terms. Let's have a single term of five years, region by region, put it there in the Constitution, weaken the center, and let us have a grip of our economy. We need a, a person who has intelligence, who has passion, who has godliness, who has courage, who is radical in nature, who can lead this country. He's a radical who can lead this country. He, it's just that I am in the church. I would have put myself up. We would have gone around. We are radical enough to take... You, 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 you need a righteous madman to, to clean this country. Who will not be corrupt? Who will not look at the face of anybody? Who will clear out all the mess and move this country forward? People who have track record. Those who have no track record, they are coming. Those who have failed as governors are coming as senators. And they are assaulting our integrity by putting themselves up. It's as if we have no people here. In a country of more than 250 million, we are no longer the giant of Africa. But innately, we are great. Nigerians go outside this country and they perform excellently well. How can we not face this country? We have enough brains in the diaspora and here to face this country. Thank you very much, my lord. My lord, that means you are saying that Christians, you are encouraging Christians to move into politics. They should move what? a mass. Those who know what they are doing, who have the ideas, who have the fear of God, and who have the practical, pragmatic roadmap to development, who have proving records. That's what they should do. Then, my lord, why do you think that South East should be given opportunity? We, the Yorubas have had it for a long time. Houses have had it for a long time. You should go to the Ibos. They've proven themselves in industry, but when it gets to them, they too should not repeat the mistake of the other people by messing it up. Because even among the Igbo governors, who is the star among them? Among themselves, are they united? Look at Anambra State alone. You want to contest for governorship in Anambra State, 20 people are putting themselves forward. Look at their acrimony. So it is because our houses are not in order that we cannot recommend ourselves credibly mm. to the center. But if they can sit down and have a consensus candidate, forget about whether you are from this part or that part, and let us not play politics of ethnicity. Let's look for the right people who can fix this country. The country needs to be fixed. Otherwise, the country will go under. It's a time of emergency now. That is the reason why. The reason why you should go to them is because of balancing, so that at least correct that injustice. After Biafra, we should allow them to have, not just have a taste because you must have a taste, have a taste because others must also be there in government and heal the wounds and give them just one term, everybody one term, no more two terms. The constitutional amendment they are doing now should be done in a proper way. Well, they are not doing anything serious, they are doing trivial things. The church must have to play a role and of course the political leaders must have to play a role. Thank you very much, my Lord. Now, um, uh, away from political matters, which I believe that they are listening to you and I believe that they will hear you and the, the country will be a better place to be. Then, my Lord, I, I remember that just recently um, you, are, well, you were enthroned as the Bishop of the uh, of uh, Elisha Anglican Communion. I know there will be some testimonies and challenges, but basically testimonies. Can you share the testimonies you have seen so far, even from where you are coming from as an academic now, handling diocese now for the very first time? What are the challenges and the testimonies? Yes. I thank the bishops who have ruled over Elisha Diocese, Bishop Fanope, uh, Bishop Olajide, Bishop Ademowo and the Bishop Showale. They've laid good okay, Bishop Ademowo was, Ademowo was there for 12 years before he was translated to Lagos. And uh, Olaje, Olajide was there for about seven years before he was translated to Ibada. And so they had a good foundation. But even more than that foundation is the fact that Elisha is the home of evangelism. Pa S.G. Elton, who produced Idaosa, produced Adeboye, produced all these Pentecostal leaders, lived in Elisha. The daughter, only daughter, who's Nigerianized now, Ruth, is still there. So it's the home of Pentecostal outbursts all over the world. The Jose Babalola revival of the CAC in those days, he was an Anglican, by the way. Babalola was an Anglican. He gave back to the CAC that produced Redeem. 
and uh, he, he is there. It's a very strategic thing. So that was where the revival happened in Elisha in the 1930s. People were discharging themselves from hospitals and they were coming to the crusade grounds. The dead were being raised and people were being saved. That is the home of revival. And uh, incidentally, and this is funny now, Adeboye is an Anglican. He was he's a member of uh, St. St. Stephen's Anglican Church, if you were. Sometimes he still pays tithe to the Anglican Church there. So he is my parishioner now. <laughs> His constitution is under me. And then uh, WF Kumri is from Erioke. I visited Erioke during the short time when I got there. And I asked for the home of the Kumuyis. I went to the ancestral home. And I asked for the burial ground of the father of Kumuye. He was buried in August 1967. His name is in the register as an Anglican. I look at the burial ground. I'm not satisfied with the way it is. I'm personally going to rebuild that burial ground on behalf of the Anglican Church. Anglican Church respect the state, triumphant and, and the Since militant. The and so uh, the man was buried in our cemetery next to the church. And so to recognize his Anglican identity, who I personally will do that to ensure that we put it there, to bring Kumuyi back. <laughs> Thank you, my Lord. That's a good place. Yeah, the people okay. are nice. The Jeshas are very nice. There is a problem there now that has been between the two dioceses, but God is going to resolve it by the grace of God. We are working together as one. And uh, there are many rural rural, rural parishes there. And, uh, I visited one just within the short time of my assumption to office. There is no network. There is no electricity. And uh, my car couldn't go further than the point, so I had to trek about a kilometer or two before I took motorcycle. I went there and did my service here and there. It's good. I'm back. I'm happy. Any man of God must be a grassroots person. And when I was preaching my instrument service, I said, forget about professorship, forget about being VC. I'm just an evangelist here, a servant leader to the people. And that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my time in Elisha. Servant leader to the people to the rest of his time in the leisure. Thank you very much, my lord. Now, now my lord, uh, we have just a few minutes to conclude this program, but I would like you to ask you this. Um, oftentimes, people believe that, yes, the grace of God helps someone to attend to some uh, you know, height in life. And uh, you tell them, especially you see some students, uh, you are a lecturer, you are a teacher. They will not study. They say they believe in the grace of God. My question is, apart from the grace of God, is there any need for hard work or diligence for someone to succeed in life? Out of seven days, God worked for six and rested only for one day. Jesus said, I walk and my father is also walking. He said, I do the work of my father while it is day. The night will come when no man can walk. My meat is to do the work of my father who sent me and to finish his work. I have other sheep which are not of this food. I must go to them also to bring them in here. I have no home. Foxes have their hose. Boats have their nests. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. I've come among you. I see who serves. <laughs> so where do we get the idea of a latent grace that you will not pray? I mean, you will not walk out because of prayer and faith. It's a heresy. It's an abuse of grace. It is a misunderstanding of the theology of grace. God is a hard worker. We should work hard. We are to look at the ants and copy them. God does not tolerate anybody who does not work hard. He asks us to work very hard. If you consider the wind, you will not sow. In the, all situations, you should keep on working. Parable of the sower, he kept on sowing. Three failed attempts, the fourth one, he succeeded. We are on the field. The harvest is very plentiful, the laborers are very few. Anybody who is teaching grace and is abusing it is mistaken. Grace is not an excuse for you to say, my salvation is permanent. Once I'm saved, I'm saved forever. No. Ezekiel says, if a real man has been righteous all his life and he goes into sin and dies, righteousness will not be remembered. And if you have been a sinner and you come to God, that's where grace comes in. The position you are when you die will determine where you are going. So we must keep on walking. We must keep on. He said, occupy till I come. So people should not just mess up. We are not looking for people who are faith giants and who are pragmatic non-entities. We need people who can go there and let their faith be manifested in the grace of God to impact upon society. We want ambassadors of Christ who will go healing the sick, delivering those who are oppressed of the devil, and changing society who will be incorruptible and who will be people who will do what people elect them to do. Grace is not an excuse for laziness, mm. not at all. Mm. We should be working. We should be working, hard working. Grace is not an excuse for laziness. Please mm. take it from Bishop Atazaju. Thank you very much, my, my Lord. Lastly, what is your general advice to the church and to the nation? 
The Church of God should please at this time focus on evangelism and mission. We should go out, train everyone to be the priesthood of all believers. Everyone. When Jesus Christ was giving us command, three he gave. He said, go to all nations and make disciples of me. That's the first one. The second one he said, and when you go, as you go, preach the gospel. And the gospel is not prosperity gospel. Oh. He said, tell them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Number two, heal the sick. Number three, cleanse the leper. Number four, cast out demons. Number five, raise the dead. Freely you have been given, freely give. Then he ended up later by saying, all power, all authority have been given to me by my father. He has given to me, I give unto you. We should go like sheep, we go. Like lamp among wolves, we go. Our duty is to take Christianity to the marketplace, to be the bearers of the miracle and the saving grace of God to everyone, everywhere we find ourselves. That is what we should be doing. Less of programs that will not convert souls, less of buildings that are sometimes an abuse and a waste of God's resources, more on evangelism, more on taking care of the poor and the needy, more on speaking out, we need more souls. on bringing people souls for the kingdom of God, not just because of congregation, and I want to plead. Let's go back and get our youth who have left the church and bring them back. Let us have churches. Our, our Anglican church has this hymn book called Ancient and Modern, where the ancient traditions of Anglicanism are strictly maintained, liturgy strongly implemented and maintained, but where on the other side we, have given, we are giving room for the move of the Holy Spirit so that the modern children, the children who are of this age, will find a place in the Anglican church. A church that has lost its children and its youth is a church on the way to extinction. We should have a church that is based on principles, not a church where libertine theology will come in and will tolerate homosexuality, tolerate abortion, tolerate evil. Anglican church outside this country is in a total mess. If we remain the last one standing, we want a church that is full of principle, a church of holiness, a church, see what the primate is doing with the Joshua generation, thousands are coming, any impact you make upon their lives now, they will take everywhere they go. That is how to build the next generation. These are the things we should be doing. A church that goes to the grassroots, nobody is too big above the people. The people are the church. Prime Minister told me one day, be very careful, bishops, careful, clergy. It is the lady who put food on your table. They are your employers. The customer is king, even though you are the owner of your company. So the church are the people. We are called, employed to serve these people. We are nobody except servants of God. We are unprofitable servants. We are only entitled to what God gives of us. So we shouldn't build empires here. Titles should not get into our head. We should go down to the grassroots, wash their feet, take care of them, go meet them where they are. Many clergymen don't know where their parishioners are living. They know the homes of the rich people who give them money. But what of the poor people? What of those who are unemployed? The church should use money to build. You, it is wrong to be closing down factories that are closing down in Nigeria. You turn them to churches. For what purpose? No. We should be establishing factories and industry. Our children that government cannot employ, let us employ them and give them something to do. So this, we have a lot of work to do, but we are not getting it right. All churches, including the Pentecostals, is empire building. I challenge Adeboye, I challenge Kumuyi. You are 80 now, both of you. You're very soon you'll be out of circulation. T.B. Joshua went at 55. What happens? What becomes of their empire? They're building family empires. That's not right. We should be an army of evangelists, army of healers. Philip was just a deacon who was performing miracles, even had a mini rapture. After he baptized the utopian, you know, disappeared. Stephen was ordinary deacon, and look at the man of sense and wonder. So this is what, we want every Christian, powerful, minister, disciplined, holy living, and passionate for God. And in church, we come for empowerment, we go out there to use our gift and our message. And the messages of the people should be cured. Yes. Enough of entertainment, enough of glamour. Let's go back to the real matter. People are dying and going to hell in light number. COVID-19 killed about 6 million all over the world. Where are they going? Many of them are headed to hell. Our challenge is not just Nigeria, it's to go re-evangelize the whole world. And Nigeria is going to be the trigger point for evangelism. But 18 saw that the revival will come back through the Anglican church. Mm. So we must get ourselves ready. Our children will come back home. Let's make sure they have room. And those dioceses that say they don't want no stipendiary because they are professionalizing the ministry, our own children who are doctors, who are teachers, you don't allow them to come and function. 
because you say they, they are not full-time priests, you cannot pay salary. These are people, they don't need your salary. They, you, need, you need their skill. Apostle Paul was intellectual, was already a philosopher, a theologian, a lawyer. When he came into Christianity, after Jesus Christ had left, see the difference he made. 13 of the epistles he wrote, planted most of the churches in Rome, in Galatia, in Philippi. He said, I came last and I did more than them. I am an apostle from my mother's womb, even though I was a persecutor. There are many people who are called, who are sitting there doing nothing in our pews. We are dominating the services. Let's bring them in, raise leaders, and throw them out everywhere. This is what I think the church should do all across the denomination. And Anglican Church should take the lead. Why? We are the Church of Nigeria, official church of this country by colonial legacy. Thank you very much, my Lord. You've heard it there. It has been a very wonderful time with uh, the right Reverend Professor that will assert you, the Anglican Bishop of Elisha and the Bishop Theologian. My Lord, we want to thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I pray when next time we call out of your busy schedule, please find time to educate the world on what the world should be. Thank, thank you, you very much. God bless you. You are doing a great job. Thank you, sir. In this life that is full of uncertainties, uh, a lot are confused, especially when they are faced with circumstances that are very challenging to them. For our discussion today, we could say from our guests that there is no height in life you could not attain, regardless of difficult challenges in life. Furthermore, leaders in all spheres of life are advised to play their leadership role effectively, efficiently, and satisfactorily to the betterment of all. Finally, remember that the only person who can stop you from getting to any height in life is yourself. Therefore, be diligent, keep pushing. Don't give up, and someday you will get there. Remember when the going gets tough? It is only the tough that gets going. This is where we draw the curtain on today's program. Join us same time, same station, on an edition of the program. Until then, this is Anna Zichinom. So, wishing you the very best, and bye for now. <laughs>